Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. This is our podcast going into the Labor Day weekend. Where are we in 2020? Well, we have some new jobs numbers out today showing the unemployment rate has now dropped below 10% for the first time since the pandemic began, 8.4%. That's good news. Expect that to be a Trumpian talking point. Uh, we also have more polls. Um, I think the summary, without getting in too deep, is that Joe Biden continues to have a solid lead in the national polls. But and you've heard this story before. The swing state polls are tight. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, in some future podcasts. But obviously, there's a lot of things that we need to talk about today, including, look, it's it's it. For some of you, this may not come as a huge surprise. In fact, in my newsletter this morning, I wrote about Jeffrey Goldberg's piece in The Atlantic about the suckers and losers, saying don't pretend you're actually surprised by this account because the picture he paints is appalling, but it's recognizable because we've seen it so many times before, even though, but still, it is shocking. It is just shocking that the commander in chief of this country thinks that the men and women who've lost their lives or been maimed defending their country are suckers and losers. Uh, According to the story, he doesn't want wounded veterans at his parades on the ground that spectators would feel uncomfortable in the presence of amputees. Nobody wants to see that, he said. We all, and obviously, we already know how he felt about POWs. This one story, though, is just, and, you know, by... You know, within a week or so, maybe we'll get more confirmation. I mean, there's some legitimate questions about sourcing, but still, these stories are so compelling. John Kelly, his former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security and his chief of staff, his son, Robert, is buried in Section 60 at Arlington. He's a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Robert Kelly was killed in 2010 in Afghanistan when he was just 29 years old. And Trump was supposed to, on this visit, uh, he was supposed to join John Kelly in paying respects at his son's grave and to comfort the families of other fallen service members. But according to these sources that are quoted in The Atlantic, and maybe one of them is going to be John Kelly at some point, Trump is standing by Robert Kelly's grave, turns to his father and says, I don't get it. What was in it for them? Now, Kelly... Didn't go on the record with Jeffrey Goldberg. And at, at first, he, he thought that maybe Trump was making some ham-handed reference to the selflessness of America's all-volunteer force. But later, he came to realize that Trump simply does not understand non-transactional life choices. So again, uh, as I'm recording this, we don't have any name sources in this story, but there are four sources the uh, the story has been confirmed by the Associated Press and by the Washington Post. The Washington Post actually added a an additional anecdote. Uh, they they tell the story that, that of Trump telling senior advisors that he didn't understand why the government placed such value on finding soldiers missing in action because they had performed poorly and gotten caught and they deserve what they got, according to a person familiar with the discussion. Now, it is interesting watching the reaction Right now, the anti-anti-Trumpers, not surprisingly, they're not buying it. You know, they're skeptical. Where are these named sources? But see, here's the thing. And I I hope people understand this. This is the agony of the anti-anti-Trumpers. You know, even as they're professing skepticism and predicting retractions, deep down, they know that this is most likely true. It's true because we've seen it so many times before. This is the lens through which Donald Trump views the world, losers versus winners, suckers versus killers. Now, does that extend to the military? Well, we know it does. We know what he said about John McCain and being a POW. We know that he's mocked the gold-starred families. We know in the past that he suggested that soldiers in Iraq were stealing money that they were supposed to be distributing. You know, remember back when he talked about Vietnam, he described, uh, you know, avoiding sexually transmitted diseases was his quote unquote personal Vietnam and said it made him feel like a great and very brave soldier. And look, Republicans have accepted all of this. And the anti anti Trumpers found a way to look the other way. I mean, he told us who he was over and over again, and they just decided to ignore that. So I understand why people are being skeptical about this particular story, you know, without the named sources, although they may come forward at some point. 
But there's a particular reason why so many people on the right have chosen that they're not going to believe it. Because I want you to think about this. Because if this really is who Donald Trump is, then they would have to really confront the choices they've made. And they've, they've, they've swallowed a lot. They've, they have swallowed a great deal. They've looked the other way a lot. But if the commander in chief really is this small, vain, unempathetic, uh, despicable man who dishonors everything he touches, well, that's a burden. That, that's an extra burden of, of things that they need to, to think about. And, and I want to make this distinction between the anti-anti-Trumpers and the, and the hardcore Trumpers. Because the, the anti-anti-Trumpers actually um, you know, know, you know who Donald Trump is. They, they just sort of choose not to act on it. I mean, but these are people who, let's be honest about it. I mean, they think of themselves as decent people, caring, virtuous, and honor, on, you know, honorable. Christians who believe in upholding American values and they believe in American exceptionalism. They're very patriotic individuals. And again, this is this is what makes them different from the hardcore bootlickers because they don't have any illusions about Trump's character, and they they remember the times that he's mocked minorities, the disabled, and, and veterans, but they figure out ways to compensate in their consciences. Like for example, today they would much rather be talking about Nancy Pelosi's visit to a hair salon. So this story is very awkward. It's super awkward for them. Because it really raises the stakes, doesn't it? I mean, it, 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 I wrote in my newsletter this morning, which I hope if I if you haven't subscribed, I would certainly hope that you would. Uh, but what I wrote was that this story, if they believe it, would cause a stirring in the place where their consciences have been hibernating. So it's better to cling to doubt. It's better not to believe, even if they know it's true. There's another question that's sort of hanging out there, and Susan Glasser uh, wrote about this um, as, as well. She said, okay, so where the hell were these sources when all of this happened? Did I miss the part where any of those who heard the president attack war heroes quit in protest or went on the record to tell us about it now? That's an excellent question. And I think the question now is, of course, will they speak now? Will they finally come out and say, hey, I think the public... 59 days until the election needs to know what I saw, what I heard. So I think that we are going to find out whether or not these sources in the military who have been so reluctant so far to come out, not all of them. I mean, we have had uh, more and more coming, coming forward. In fact, today's episode of the Bulwark podcast is going to feature one of those insiders who has made the decision to come forward. You may have seen this ad by the Republican Voters Against Trump, a powerful testimony from a woman named Elizabeth Newman. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Newman. I am first and foremost a follower of Jesus Christ. I voted for Trump in 2016 primarily because of the pro-life issue. I served in the Trump administration at the Department of Homeland Security and became the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention. The reason government is supposed to exist is to prepare for external threats like we're seeing with COVID. There were plans put in place for a pandemic. When we started to see that a pandemic was on its way to our shores, experts told me we need to be executing on these plans. But from January until March 11th, what you saw instead was a number of good public servants attempting to do their job and the president telling them to stop because he didn't want the economy to tank and he didn't want a distraction from his campaign. I'm sorry, Mr. President, you were hired to handle America's worst day and you've absolutely failed. And this year I'll be voting for Joe Biden. Defending democracy together is responsible for the content of this ad. And joining us on today's Bulwark podcast is... Elizabeth Newman. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me. Well, you talked in, in that spot about the coronavirus, but I, I want to uh, focus at least initially on something else you've talked about as well. One of your jobs was to counteract domestic extremism and domestic terrorism. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about that and, 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 what, and what the problem is and why Donald Trump just simply doesn't want to talk about it. You know, I, I noticed that, you know, first of all, you, you went into office in early 2017, right? You, you joined right. the Department of Homeland Security. Yes. And 
So, again, what what did you see in terms of domestic terrorism? So uh, I I have to back up just a bit and say that my my career started um, in the Bush administration and I was initially focused on domestic policies. And of course, 9-11 happened and the agenda completely changed. And I ended up working uh, in the Homeland Security Council uh, in those those first years it was stood up. And my entire career has been focused on this concept of, of uh, counterterrorism within the homeland. So how do you equip our state and local law enforcement partners or emergency management officials to be able to counter whatever the threats of the day are? And for 15 plus years post 9-11, those threats were predominantly international uh, terrorism, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and others. And when we came in in 2017, the the assumption was that that was still the the biggest threat. So the the lens through which we were were looking at the threat landscape was a default to that international terrorism. But we started to see things that that made us kind of pause and 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 question what what is going on. It started with really it started in the 2016 uh, campaign cycle, which at at some level, we just brushed aside as uh, campaign politics and rhetoric being really um, um, polarized. But but you saw this this language that was uh, was hateful and and um, you know borderline, if not totally, about white nationalism. And and you 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 thought you know I I think this is just a blip. You kind of you just kind of thought this was. Uh, not necessarily going to stick around. But then we had a spate of vandalisms occur at Jewish cemeteries in March of 2017. That made us pause and and ask what's going on. And then Charlottesville happened in August, and that really got everybody's attention. In Charlottesville, what we saw was this, uh, you know, clothed in the rhetoric of conservatism, um, this idea of you know, you know the, the, even the the rally's name was unite the right, um, mm-hmm. and and so to the to the average person initially you're just like okay so you've got some polarized figures on the right uh, clashing with some polarized figures on on the left Antifa you know being um, kind of prominent. Um, and, and maybe that's all it is. And then when you saw the images, you, it just was very jarring. You had people, um, walking through the streets of Charlottesville clad in khaki pants and a button down shirt, um, saying Jews will not replace us. And you're like, whoa, 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 this is, this isn't about, um, a conversation on, on, on conservative values or conservative talking points. This is something totally uh, you know, that, that I think we all thought had gone away, that, that if you have people with these views, they, they hide under rocks, they, um, operate in the, the deep web and it is not, uh, acceptable to, to, to talk that way, to act that way anymore. Um, and to have it just full out, in view was really, really shocking. So it, it certainly caused a number of us to kind of look deeper. You started to talk to law enforcement and find uh, they have, in fact, been seeing more more hate crimes, more vandalisms, more um, you know suspicious in- incidents targeted at people, uh, um, predominantly an anti anti Semitic, but but also people of color. And and you when you were talking to the the people that were actually doing the work in the streets, you started to realize like something's been unleashed here. And so at the time, I think we we were looking at this. Not not thinking like this is at the same level as ISIS, but we need to pay attention. We need to do something here. We need to understand what's going on. Um, and then we moved to 2018. And but, yeah, and this is so you you start off as deputy chief of staff to John yeah. Kelly, who's the secretary of Homeland Security, and then he moves on to become Trump's chief of staff. And so by March, you were in a new role. That's when you became March 2018. You become the assistant secretary for counterterrorism and threat prevention. So yes. that so your your job now is you're in charge of these emerging threats. And so this is this is when you're focusing on these right wing extremists. Right. And it was it was one of those um 
kind of jarring moments that you would turn to our intelligence community and say, okay, give me, give me the threat assessment. What do we know about these groups? What's going on? And they couldn't explain it in large part because our intelligence apparatus isn't designed to do that kind of uh, assessment uh, domestically. We've, we have uh, laws on the books that allow us to look overseas at threats, but we can't use some of those tools domestically for good reason, for constitutional reasons. But it was um, concerning that nobody inside the government could actually tell you what's their motivation, what is their uh, purpose. in um, And who who are they? Yeah. No, really, who are these people? And, you know, I mean, mean, are they organized? Is it something that are they just being radicalized online? You know, you know, a la ISIS, Uh, are they? How do, how do you describe who these people are? Because I agree with with your take that when I first saw these guys, I thought, who are they? I This is something that I thought had been had been erased decades ago. I didn't recognize any of these people, but obviously they were there. They were getting energy and they were in larger numbers than I would have ever imagined. Exactly. It, and it's rather stunning. It prompted me to kind of do my own research research. Uh, relied on think tanks that have looked at this. Um, nonprofits like the ADL have been tracking incidents for, for across the decades. But uh, one person in particular that really helped me put this into context with, was a professor out of the University of Chicago named Kathleen Ballou. And she wrote a book called Bring the War Home and describes the nature of the white power movement from the 70s until just after Oklahoma City. So she's a historian and she's looking Uh, through historical records to kind of paint this picture. But I found it really helpful to understand that what we're seeing today, it's not as if it just popped up. This is uh, decades long planning and um, intentional strategic approach to this movement. Um, So a couple of things that- By whom? By the by the the white power movement and and she calls them a movement as opposed to an organization intentionally because part of their strategy is to to form leaderless resistance. Um, they found that if they were organized, if they had somebody at the top that was you know a name that it, that it was easier for law enforcement to go after them and take them down. So in 1983, she she points that they got together um, the neo-Nazis, the, the Klan, the, a, a group of you know, different, different organizations, militia organizations, they came together and changed their strategy and for the first time articulated that their goal was the overthrow of the government and that the way that they were going to do it was through this leaderless resistance approach. And, and the, the piece about the overthrow of the government is I find really fascinating because you have to go even further back to understand why that's a significant shift for them. The, the fact is that the concept of white supremacy has been within our governments, uh, within, within the U.S. government since our founding, right? And, and most Americans understand and, and appreciate that, um, but we kind of lose some historical granularity when it comes to the the post civil war reconstruction era uh, mm-hmm. there are there are pictures uh, from in the 1920s of people in clans uh get up walking down Pennsylvania Avenue walking down the Washington Mall I've seen I've seen that picture yeah and huge, then, huge crowds yeah well look, the, the Klan was a major uh, factor at, at democratic conventions in 1920 exactly. 1924. So for, for a, a century, um, government was in support of white supremacy, right? Like they were, they were aligned in their goals. And then the Civil Rights Act gets passed, the Vietnam War occurs, and you have a whole bunch of people come home very angry at the government. And there's this realization, the government is no longer supporting our aims. And the only way for us to deal with this is to, in fact, uh, to, in fact, do uh, overthrow them. So can you give me a profile of, of a young male person who is in this? They're, they're mainly males, right? I mean, there, I know that there are, there are women who are part of this, but, but I'm having, I'm, I'm focusing again on the images from Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. I guess part of me, you know, you're talking about as a movement, I'm just seeing disaffected 
guys who've been playing too many video games in their mom's basement who can't get <laughs> girlfriends who've been reading batshit crazy stuff i mean who who g give me a profile of the kind of person that is attracted to doing this the kind of person that would show up at charlottesville the kind of person that would show up you know at a uh, you know in in a city like kenosha or portland with a knife a gun or you know a vehicle to ram somebody who are these people you know, they're, they're, it's hard to give you a single profile, yeah. right? So um, the, there are, and, and uh, Dr. Blue kind of describes this in her book, and, and again, she's talking historically, but but has asserted that these um, descriptions probably apply today. There's not a lot of good data about uh, about what's happening today. So so she she always applies that caveat. But the you know at the core, you're, you're going to have a small group of adherents who organize their lives around this ideology that we, uh, the great replacement the uh, theory is happening. And therefore I need to marry people of like mind, produce white babies. And they, it, it's almost like a, a, a church, right? You just, you do life together. You, you go to picnics together and, and you form your life around this, this ideology. And then outside of that core is, is going to be another uh, a larger group that um, be maybe believe, but don't necessarily organize their lives around it. But they would attend rallies. They they don't mind being associated with it, um, but they're not maybe as hardcore as the the true adherents. And then you have an, an additional concentric circle of people who understand that it would not be appropriate or socially acceptable for them to be public about their beliefs, but but hold them in fact and and will support. Uh, through you know other means, um, maybe financially or maybe just in consumption of material and, and trying to spread the rhetoric and, and recruit people. Um, so part of the way that the white power movement has been successful is that they have capitalized on whatever the grievances are of in the in the moment. So um, things that tend to be fairly political, uh, fairly conservative um, causes, they often use for recruitment purposes. And, and one of the things that I think is so important and why I've been very frustrated that we haven't had a, a clear voice from the top of our government call out this threat is that they are using things like a fear of immigration, a fear of um, refugees coming to our country, a fear of the government taking away your guns. Mm. They're using- this sounds, from, this sounds familiar. Exactly. They're using things that on its face, it is perfectly reasonable for a conservative to to have a conversation about gun rights or about um, you know the proper way that we bring refugees in and make sure they're screened and vetted. Um, but the moment that you go into that fear place and this grievance gets set in, um, it allows individuals to become vulnerable to being recruited into mm. deeper, darker things. So that's the concern I have is that that you have probably an, any number of people that are um, unwitting to the fact that they are being preyed upon. And then your, your core question about like, how do you, how do you, um, what's the profile of somebody that goes and carries out an attack that there's been a lot of research on. And those individuals do tend to be, um, you know, disaffected, um, they they lack belonging in some way. They've often had stressors in their life. They they have risk factors, and uh, the the Secret Services National Threat Assessment Center, the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, has studied attackers over the last three decades and put together kind of a picture of of what these. Uh, factors might be, which is really helpful for the line of business I was in. It allowed us to design prevention programming to be able to identify these individuals, hmm. hopefully before they cross a criminal threshold, get them help, get them, address those core root causes before they carry out an act of violence. Okay, so let's talk about one of these attacks. And I know you've talked about this extensively, this, this attack, the El Paso shooting from August of uh, 2019, where you had this 21-year-old gunman who kills 23 people, uh, wounds 26 others in the parking lot of a Walmart. And let me read you something that you had said. You said, when you see the El Paso attack, uh, attacker, his manifesto was citing language and rhetoric that comes from the president's campaign rallies about an invasion from Mexico and how we've got to protect our country. 
So there, there's one of those moments where we have we have to confront the these words and these themes have consequences. And whatever the intention is, this is actually feeding the phenomenon that you're talking about. Exactly. And and I I can appreciate that maybe he did not understand that his words were having this effect. You're talking about Trump. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Post El Paso, post El Paso, there is no excuse. Um, it, it just the correlation was so clear that that this individual carried out this attack because of this language that that to be fair, um, other you know certainly the white power movement has been advocating certainly um, even you know conservatives that would not consider themselves right. white supremacists um, have have express this concern. But when it comes from the top, when it comes from the president, it carries a lot more weight and it, and it spreads, um, through th- in, in a way that, uh, that, that just normal chatter online, um, doesn't have the power to spread. So the moment that you realize that your rhetoric is aligned with this, this, um, attackers, uh, justification mm-hmm. for killing people, the proper response is to come out and condemn it, to come out and say, look, folks, there's a difference between what I'm trying to do and protect our country and build a wall and you taking matters into your own hands. There's a way that he could have done it and still, you know, I'm sure he would have been criticized, but there's a way he could have done it and still be, been able to stay true to his policy goals of, of building a wall. But of course, that's that's not his style. His style, no. which you've also described as, his style is to use rhetoric that intends to sow fear, right? I mean, the point of his rhetoric is actually to gin people up and to scare people. Exactly. And we see it on full display this summer. Uh, it is, you know, part of my um, my own uh, process of coming to grips with the fact that I could not vote for him um, and not just... Uh, decide to do a write-in candidate, but to to vote for Joe Biden is is realizing how dangerous his rhetoric is and his unwillingness to change. I, I just, I, you, it is so clear to me that his values, what he cares about, is his himself. He cares about his political power. He cares about winning, and at the at the sacrifice of people dying, and and I, I just I cannot. I cannot. So th- this th- this was one of the key moments for you, right? I mean, the the, the El Paso shooting, because um, you know I've been reading, doing a little bit of background reading, and you, you were really trying to secure funding specifically to address domestic extremism. But this administration really doesn't. I mean, do they want to call it domestic extremism? I mean, do they did were, were they willing to acknowledge the fact that there is right wing terrorism that there is a right right wing violence out there or is, or is that kind of taboo in this administration it is taboo in this administration we initially when i mean secretary nielsen asked to address this as early as december 2017 she was rebuffed by the national security council she asked again later that summer she was rebuffed again. We, we asked again after the attack in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life Synagogue in October 2018. Again, we're pushed off. And over and over and over again, um, it was clear that the, the National Security Council was not going to take this on. And at the in the moment, we just assumed, and, and this may still be the case, but we assumed that the reason they weren't taking it up is that they wanted to focus on other international threats, uh, Iran yeah. and ISIS. And and there's there's some you know, I'll give them some deference. There's a lot of threats that we face globally. And if they have the right to set that prioritization, but the, the point at which I, I, my, my position changed and said, no, at this point you're culpable is after El Paso. And there was clearly a sense in the white house that politically they were vulnerable because they jumped into action in a way that I haven't seen them act in any of the other attacks that have occurred. Now in other attacks, the president would come out and condemn it. Um, he, he is on the record as, as, uh, uh, calling out um, against anti-Semitic attacks. Um, so so it's not that he had not spoken out against these attacks. It's just that for the first time, you started to see them doing the policy work around what is happening with all of this violence. But that's how they saw it. They very much 
framed it as these are mentally unwell people and we need to address uh, the, the root cause of their mental wellness. Um, so you saw them investing in um, we need to increase uh, funding for mental health. We need to mm-hmm. um, uh, work on gun control, which, hey, I, I think we should have a robust conversation about that. But I thought it was kind of ironic that they thought that in the current state of politics that they were actually going to be able to touch the third rail of, of, of D.C. politics. Um, and then when we brought to them the uh, the, the prevention uh, uh, the prevention strategy that we had been working on for about 18 months, they, they were extremely supportive. They were like, this is great. We totally support. We'll, we'll make sure that we get this built into the budget that comes out in February. Um, but we're just going to call it violence prevention. And I violence prevention rather than domestic terrorism. Exactly. And I yeah. said, that's fine. I just need you to know that my secretary, which at the time was McAleenan, uh, and myself will be talking about this, in the full context, which is, yes, we had, we do have a problem with targeted violence in this country. The, the Las Vegas massacre is classified that way. But, but we also have a significant threat from these domestic terrorists. And statistically speaking, they have killed more people and launched more attacks than any other terrorist threat that we have faced. And, and they were like, got it, got it. We have to talk about it in terms of violence prevention. And you just, in you in this administration, you, when you get told that, you just kind of nod your head and you're like, sure. got it. you got to do your thing. I got to do mine. So the president is now, though, he is now talking about domestic extremism, but he's really talking about it in terms of what's going on in the streets. He's using it in, in relationship to Antifa. So let, let, let's just sort of fast forward to what we're having right now. This is a president who's running for reelection all in on law and order, potentially saying, look, I am the only thing that stands against you and the the domestic extremists who he always characterizes as being on on the left. So give me your I mean, you've you've watched this. You, you, you know what the actual threat is. And yet, if you listen to the president of the United States or much of the debate that we're having now, um, the biggest threat is Antifa. Is Antifa the biggest threat? Absolutely not. Uh, it is. Uh, widely documented, um, both in public measures as well as the the um, uh, briefings that I would receive when I was in the government, that they are what we would consider a low grade threat, the kind of thing that a local police department or a state police department would need to be aware of if it's operating in their jurisdiction. Uh, usually they become a problem in a counter protest type of uh, scenario. So like what we saw in Charlottesville, you have one group uh, that's there to support um, something that most of us would in America would condemn, like white supremacy, and then they show up to counter that protest, and at yeah. times that turns violent. But their their motive and their intention is not necessarily violence against people. Um, so statistically speaking, they are not the ones that commit uh, these these acts that kill. Okay. People. So, so talk to me about the the Boogaloo movement um, or its association with QAnon. Where, where, are the, where does that all fit into this? You know, it's it's funny because every day you wake up and there's like a new group that's been named. But this, yeah. this Boogaloos. Is, yeah, exactly. This is part of that leaderless resistance concept, right? So when you are leaderless, you you can uh, create something new and everybody will kind of support you. Um, but the, the aim there is still the same. They're trying to disrupt um, our, our way of life. They're trying to uh, eventually overthrow the government. So um, Boogaloo is uh, maybe not as um, extreme in certain, in certain ideologies, but they all kind of tend to tie together. And clearly they've been, they've been arrested um, in several of the uh, protests that have occurred this summer, including um, uh, under investigation, a uh, possible indictment for um, or are being indicted for the killing of a, a, a DHS employee, mm. a federal a protective service officer. So, um, you know, the, the, the threat that these folks pose is that they tend to see these protests, these peaceful protests, or even the protests that aren't peaceful, that have moved into rioting and looting, they view this as an opportunity to come in and accelerate the uh, deconstruction of our society. Because again, the ultimate goal is 
We want to disrupt the world as we know it so that we can assert a white nation, so we can become, a, go back to our glory days and be a white nation. Um, so they view any opportunity to, uh, to disrupt our social order as, as a benefit to their cause. Uh, Rita Katz did a really great explanation of this uh, yesterday. Um, and it, it, it would encourage your listeners to go read it because she does much more justice than I do trying to help explain um, the the value of chaos to an extremist. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very telling. The QAnon's a little different. QAnon is, um, you know, it almost feels like a, a, it started as a parlor game of you know, people <laughs> that got bored and were just kind of fantasizing about you know, different crazy things. But then every once in a while, you, you find that people actually believe it. They actually believe that there are people drinking children's blood and worshiping Satan and um, running huge child sex, sex trafficking rings. And um, can I just say for anybody that might be on the edge that maybe some of this is true, I have held that clearance. <laughs> I worked human trafficking. I have looked at emerging threats across our country nothing that they pose is true. So it is, uh, if it, if it's a threat, it's a threat in two ways. One, it distracts from important work that does go on in human trafficking, uh, with one of the, the things that QAnon, uh, uh, was really stirring up over the, uh, I think it was in August about Wayfair, about how Wayfair was trafficking children by selling cabinets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I appreciate that, you know, many well-meaning Americans were alarmed that something like that could happen. And so they called the human trafficking hotline, Polaris. And, and Polaris came out after the fact and said, look, we know statistically how many real human trafficking victims call us on any given day. And we know that some of those calls didn't get through because our lines were flooded with this call uh, narrative. So I, my, I would beg the um, reasonable person that, that listens to this podcast, please, please do your homework before you before you cause harm to a real human trafficking victim. Um, these these uh, theories that you see on the internet they they aren't true, and I and I there's so much there's so much damage that goes unseen because they keep propagating it. Uh, on last week's podcast, I talked with Miles Taylor, who, of course, was one of your colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security. And, and I'm going to ask you this similar question to one that I asked him. You were there from the beginning of uh, 2017 through the end of 2019. What took you so long to realize you didn't want to be part of this? Why did you stay yeah. so long? Because I'm guessing that early on you looked around and go that a lot of this stuff I can't support. Yeah. You know, I, I, it, it actually started before the election, uh, before the inauguration. Mm -hmm. I, I said no twice to coming in and it was the third time that somebody asked me that, um, and they were describing, uh, what they were seeing during the transition period, the backstabbing, the the folks that were coming in were only about themselves. They didn't have any experience in the Homeland Security space. Um, I was really concerned for our country. And um, at the time, I, I watched John Kelly's confirmation hearing, and I felt um, at least reassured that he, he was a, a man of uh, experience and integrity. And if if I could work for him, then um, it would be worth the the effort uh, to endure every the chaos that that is Trump world. Um, but it was a hard decision to come in, and I there, I had many moments where I was on my knees praying and asking if it was time to go um, because it was it was exhausting, it was chaotic, it was toxic. You couldn't trust anybody. But the reason that we we stayed in, those of us that were li of like mind, and there were quite a number of us, the reason we stayed in is because we love our country. And we felt that by staying there, we offered top cover to the career civil servants who were trying to do their jobs. We protected them as much as we could from the, the chaos above us. And we felt that, uh, especially at the beginning, there was a time period where the president was uh, steerable. You could you can move him in the right direction to you know not necessarily say there's only one right answer, but you know look at these three options as opposed to this extreme measure. 
And, and there was a period where that we were able to do that. But at this point, um, uh, as they like to say, all of the adults in the room have left. And, and by the end of 2019, it was becoming really clear to me that um, it, it, I, needed, I needed to move on. I knew at that point I wasn't going to vote for him. Um, I hadn't, if somebody had asked me earlier, I probably would, could have told you in 2018 or 2017 that I wouldn't vote for him again, but I just hadn't thought about it. Uh, and once I, once I started going through that process, I came to the realization it, I needed to move on. But I, the mm-hmm. other piece that, um, that I, I like to point out, and I, I hope it doesn't come off as defensive, but um, I, my line of, of work is counterterrorism. So I, I, I've learned a lot about immigration in the last few years, but I I did not come in working on that that issue set, and right. so it took me a while to understand how um, how much I disagreed with their with their immigration policies, and um, and and that said, it wasn't the thing I was responsible for, and there were important yeah. things in that counterterrorism bucket that I, I could contribute to, and that's why I stayed as long as I did. So are you in touch at all with John Kelly anymore? No, I'm not. I, I think the world of him, um, and, I, and I'm in touch with people that are in touch with him. So let's look ahead, um, because you, you mentioned a little while ago that uh, many of these movements thrive in an environment of chaos, but we have a president whose style is defined by chaos. Exactly. I mean, this is, he was the chaos candidate, and now he's the chaos president. So right now, I mean, I have this sense, and I don't think you're going to talk me off this ledge. I just have a sense you're not going to talk me off this ledge, that this country is a powder keg, that when you have the president of the United States who sees his, uh, his, his role as being you know, the, 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 the chaos maker in chief as opposed to the healer in chief, this thing seems like it's spiraling um, almost on a daily basis with more encouragement for extremism and an escalation to violence. The, the, the way in which uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old shooter in Kenosha, is being made a folk hero on the right strikes me as just one of the most dangerous and reckless things that I've seen happen in American politics in a very long time. And it seems to, to, to fit exactly into the scenarios that you've been describing. I, I'm not going to talk to you off that ledge. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, share, I share your concern. Um, I, I don't know. And, and that's part of the reason I'm speaking out. I, I feel like there are, um, to borrow the phrase, there is a large silent majority that is watching in horror and is afraid to speak out. And I've heard from many of those folks since I've started talking about how they, they've they been having uh, the same concerns, but they're afraid to speak out because they might get attacked by Republicans and they might get attacked by Democrats. And it's just, it's so hard to know how to speak in a way that just even raises your concerns and, and not get attacked. <laughs> and it's it's so sad that that's where we are in our country that you cannot ask a question without fear of being attacked by both sides. Um, but I do, I do hope that by having these dialogues, by drawing attention to the fact that there are, uh, there are, e- there are evil groups and on the extreme, this is not the preponderance mm-hmm. of Republicans or conservatives, but they are there on the extreme and they are exploiting this. And therefore you conservative, you Republican, you moderate, you, you liberal be careful with your rhetoric. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. Stop using the talking points and actually think through the issue that you're trying to to discuss or resolve. Um, If we would listen to each other more instead of just yelling at each other, and I realize that the example that we have in the Oval Office right now is the exact opposite, but we we can we can do better than this, um, but I I share your concern, and I talk with many other uh, law enforcement and counterterrorism professionals, and we are all very very concerned that we will see an increase in violence. Um, some of it will may look like the type of violence we've seen in the last couple of weeks, which are um, not necessarily premeditated, but just that powder keg effect of, of angry people that have weapons with them and not good judgment. And then they, they, um, caught, they act out in violence. Um, so I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned that we have people in that extreme fringe 
who would love to carry out a mass attack, who would love to um, repeat an Oklahoma City bombing. In fact, there were there was an arrest of somebody who uh, was attempting to outdo McVeigh in Oklahoma City this summer. So, so it, we we have two threats. We have the the powder keg, um, throw fuel on the fire, angry polarized uh, rhetoric that is increasing. Uh, uh, not not premeditated violence, but but nonetheless, it's kind of you know one of those things that if you if you're clear headed, you kind of can see you probably shouldn't put two angry people together with weapons. You know, maybe maybe that's not a you good think. Idea. Yeah, I mean, and this yeah, is I'm. I'm I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment, as I'm sure you are. But you know, your point is, look, it, 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 as this thing becomes, as this thing escalates and escalates and escalates, and you do have people with powerful weapons uh, in close proximity um, with rhetoric demonizing one another, calling one another enemies, where the rhetoric encourages you to think of uh, your opponent, I mean, the person standing across from you, you know, as an enemy of the people, an enemy of democracy, whatever, um, bad things are going to happen inevitably. And when you make heroes out of the people who shoot and kill other people, there's an escalation. Yeah. So we've had a, pro a process of the radicalization of some of these extremists. I feel in some ways we're watching the radicalization of an entire movement. And by a movement, I mean lots of folks on the right who I never would have imagined coming up with rationalizations for acts of violence, um, even the killing of, of people in the streets. And once you cross that, you just don't know where it's going to go. You don't know there are too many people out there who are unstable, too many situations that are completely unpredictable, and that's where we're at. And we have 60 days to go, and it's not going to get calmer between now and November. Absolutely. I, I, I'll i add to it the, um, you know, I, I cited earlier the Secret Services research, the FBI's research. One of the commonalities in an attacker is that they've usually had a series of stressors in their life. So um, they've lost a job or they've lost a loved one or they've had a bad breakup or um, something significant in their life changed, right? So it's not as if any of us in, in 2020 have experienced stressors, right? I mean, the, the <laughs> nature of a pandemic alone, the fear associated with something so unknown and unseen, Great point. am I going to get sick and losing jobs or um, having the kids at home and trying to juggle the job, all of these stressors are, are universal for our society right now. So you take somebody that already was maybe uh, disaffected, didn't feel a sense of belonging, socially isolated. Now they're even more socially isolated because nobody's allowed to leave their homes. No. And then you have these additional uh, stress of um, maybe the economy or death or um, what, you know, just what they're seeing on TV and the president's rhetoric. All of that is just a, a really, really um, scary mix of, of, uh, the type of thing that leads somebody to carry out an attack. And there we are on September 4th, 2020. Elizabeth Newman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and being so generous with your time. Well, thank you, Charlie. It's been a pleasure. I, I appreciate what you all do. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We have a long weekend. We will be back on Tuesday and we will do this all over again. There are now 59 days to go until the November election.